Wat als deze video wordt verwijderd? Wat als dit kanaal niet meer bestaat? Café Weltsmerts heeft een plan. Ga naar onze site en registreer jezelf. En word onderdeel van de oplossing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Café Weltsmerts. My name is Max van der Werf. And today I have a very interesting guest. It's no one less than Sas Rogando Sassot from the Philippines. Sas is a Filipino writer based in the Netherlands and currently a docent at Maastricht University. Uh, Sas graduated from Leiden University with a combined major in world politics and global justice. She graduated magna cum laude and a master's, is a master's in uh, international relations. Sas, welcome. Um, Thanks for having me here. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I first found you on Facebook, on the Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was shocked to see you have more than 700,000 followers. Uh, so maybe you explain a little bit, how did that happen? Well, it happened so fast. Yeah. I started my Facebook page in August 2016 mm -hmm. after a friend of mine encouraged me to open a Facebook page. Uh, his name is RJ Nieto. He's the one behind another huge political blog in the Philippines. It's yeah. called Thinking Pinoy. Yeah. And he encouraged me to open a Facebook page because my personal Facebook page kept being reported. And, oh. and you were banned for like... I be, I be or censored? Suspended. suspended. Facebook, Facebook kept on suspending me first for three days and then seven days. And then the longest one was for a month. Okay. And a lot of people kept reporting my Facebook page for various reasons. It was during the time uh, that I was writing about the South China Sea conflict. Mm -hmm. And because of that issue, a lot of people tune into my okay. personal We'll, we'll, personal we'll get to that later. Yes. Right? Let, let's, first, yes. <laughs> let's first go back uh, what is a very big part of your yeah. identity. Um, I saw you were in the United Nations talking. Can you explain what happened? Well, it was in December 2009. I... Yes, yeah, so it's more than 10 years ago. Yes. And you look very young in the video. You still look <laughs> young now, but then... Much younger. <laughs> yeah, but you were addressing an issue. Explain it to us, please. I was invited by a group of countries yeah. to speak in the United Nations in December 2009. It was the first um, LGBT-themed um, yeah. General Assembly site event. So it was a kind of for United Nations, for the United Nations revolutionary event? It was, it was. Mm -hmm. And um, a group of NGOs recommended my name. Yeah. So I got the gig and I got an email from the Swedish, uh, the, from the permanent mission of Sweden to the United Nations inviting me to speak. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and, and in December 2000, December 9, 2009, I spoke and... And very eloquently. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and next thing I know, people sending, mes sending me messages because my speech got featured in the official YouTube channel of the United Nations. No. It was the only yeah. speech during that time that got featured, so yeah. And do you feel you made a difference in the whole debate about transgender equality and rights and all that? Well, I don't... I, I'm, I'm not... I'm not sure if I did any difference, if, if I made any difference when it comes to policy. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to quote what one of my fellow speakers told me after the speech. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the one from Uganda. I forgot your name. I'm so sorry. Okay. He approached me and then told me, I'm, I'm very sure that this, this people, the, referring to the diplomats who were there, wouldn't be able to change anything after after this panel. But I'm very mm -hmm. sure if um, someone watched your speech, they would think twice before mistreating a trans person in their life. Mm -hmm. And nice. I think um, in that sense, I think I made a difference. I remember a friend of mine, she was, her, her mother didn't accept her before, so what she did was she let her mother watch my speech. Okay. And after her mother watched my speech, her mother had a 360-degree 360, 360 turn, so and now... You made a difference for at least one person. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think 
for me, if even at least one, if it made a difference in one person's life, I think that's good enough. Mm -hmm. Of course, it would be spectacular. Well, if I it think changed. there will be much more. I hope so. Mm -hmm. And okay, maybe it's a weird question because for me, it's a very difficult subject to yeah. comprehend. Um, I never thought I want to be a woman. So mm -hmm. when when did this feeling occur? You're not a man, but you're a woman. What what? How old were you? And how did it, how did this knowledge? I mean, was it just there one day you woke up, or did it develop, or? Well, I never saw myself as a boy. So as far as I can remember, I've always seen myself as a girl. So I never had a face in my life wherein I had to choose, okay, am I a boy or a girl? So the, my earliest memory already was um, me having this uh, feeling and conviction that I'm a girl. So there was never a crisis? There was never an identity crisis. Mm, surprises yeah. me. <laughs> Why? <there> was, <laughs> because that is what I would expect to be the normal case, or maybe for every yeah. person. But it's maybe a shock. And <clears throat> you know, everything's going, to be, everything's going to be different. People are going to make fun of you, or I mean, no? Well, I, I already knew from as early as four or five that, there, um, that people are making fun of me. <laughs> You know, my, you're, my, you were used to it when you were four or five years old. Yes, so um, gotta hurt somehow. Four, or five, six. I think um, they made f fun of me because um, I beat them in a game that they should be dominating. My father, <laughs> my father. Yes. Yes, um, my father uh, is a national is a national master of chess, uh -huh. and he taught me how to play chess at a very young age. So cool. I was playing with the boys in the neighborhood, and then they often lose, and you beat them, and then they hate and then you for they that. hate <laughs> for that, and then that that's the time that they would start to tease me like fagot. So oh, we, yeah, so nice. there, yeah, there was this um, there is this term in the Philippines. It's called bakla, and bakla. Yeah, it's a it's a slang for fagot. Oh, so it's not a nice word at all. Well, I never, I never um, had a nice encounter with the term when I was growing up. So it okay, you grew up, yeah. you became uh, a teenager. Yes. What happened? Uh, when I turned thirteen, I started taking hormones, and um, you had a medical program. No, you... I wasn't in a medical program. It, this was like mid nineties, so everything was word of mouth. So in our school, we had like, uh, I had older trans um, schoolmates. And then when they saw me, they, they approached me and then told me, oh, you should start taking hormones now so that when you turn 17, you wouldn't turn masculine. And I was like, oh, that's what I wanted. And they recommended to me this birth control pill. It was a very famous birth control pill for, for anyone who would like to start taking hormones. And okay. Yeah. And that worked? Or it, made it, a actually, it, it actually worked. Uh, I remember when I was first but year But you, you were far younger than 17, you say, because it would have made a change when you're 17. So what, uh, what age you started with that? I started... What did your parents say? I mean... I started at 13. Of course, my mother didn't knew that I, would, that I was already taking hormones until, of course, she found out about it because she saw birth control, oh birth control pill in, in my room. And yeah, she... She was angry because of that. Maybe worried? Yes, worried and yeah, angry. It was like mixed emotions. Wow. Yeah. Oh, let me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you introduced the term uh, trans Pinai issues. So Pinai from the Philippines. Um, you want anything else to say about being a transgender? Is it, I mean, is it different in the Netherlands than in the Philippines? Because you live in the Netherlands, you feel widely, it's widely accepted here, or there's some hypocrisy, maybe? Well, I would say that in general, my experience here in the Netherlands is um, very positive. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the situation in the Philippines is quite complex. Right? It's Complex in the sense? In the sense that, you know, um, I would like to recall what one, um, one, what one journalist asked me. He mm -hmm. was writing for Paris Match before, so mm -hmm. he interviewed me. And then his question was, 
um, I think this was in 2008, so he asked me, um, does transgender activism make any sense in the Philippines? Mm -hmm. You are like walking here in the Philippines freely on the streets, yeah. you are everywhere, but this is not something that we see often in Paris or any place okay. in Europe. And that, you know, that made me think. And what I told him was, I think the different because I, I was I was already traveling to Europe during that time for speaking engagement, so I know yeah. um, the situation in Europe. So I just told him that yeah, it made sense because you what you're seeing right now is not really the acceptance of Filipinos, but really the courage of people like me to walk on the streets. And I think um, trans people in the Philippines are more courageous than our trans. Um, colleagues in, in Europe. Colleagues, right? you call them colleagues. <laughs> yes, <laughs> fellow trans people in okay. Europe. Amazing. I think I, I think we're more we're more courageous in in a sense. But when you're going to compare about the our situation here, you do have anti discrimination laws of in course, in, yeah. in Europe. You do have um, health insurance that cover transgender related healthcare. We don't have it here. Yeah. You you know. Yeah. Th there would be a higher chance of me being accepted in the workplace in yeah. the Netherlands than in the Philippines. Yeah, but on your Facebook page, I do see regularly some very nasty comments. Yes. It's like, uh, yes. I saw a comment of a woman. She says, uh, well, you can pretend to be a woman, but you don't have a vagina. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's quite shocking. <laughs> and then. I, I don't want to say, but did you reply? You know the reply you gave. I, I don't want to quote you. Oh my God. I want to hear it from you. I am very, um, I don't hold my tongue when, when, when yeah. I um, reply to people in, in, in my blog. I think it's, you know, my, my, both of my parents are from Beagle, and the Beagle region is known for their spicy food. And with spicy food comes spicy tongue. So <laughs> I think that I inherited. So what was your reply? So my reply. You're, you're wrapping it up. But yes, my you, reply. You gave a very direct reply. <laughs> my reply was, well, I have. It was paid by the Dutch government. You have a vagina <laughs> paid by the Dutch taxpayers. Yes. Uh, now it's out. <laughs> so I help pay for your vagina. Well, I also is, paid for it because I pay taxes. Which I gladly do. It's no problem. But, uh, the nastiness of the uh, comments yeah, is uh, it, it, striking. It, but, but it's nothing compared yeah. to what happened after you talked about politics, mm -hmm. about the South China Sea dispute, because that is your expertise as a professional. Um, so let's slowly move to that. Uh, <laughs> From vagina to South China yeah, Sea conflict. Yeah, a big step maybe. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about this nine dash line that the Chinese yes. made um, mm. and what it means for the Philippines, what it means the Freedom of Navigation Act for the Americans. So there's clearly uh, a power struggle between China and the United States, and it's about control of the Pacific. So you take it from here. Well, <laughs> what, what should we talk about about the well, nine, the, nine, dash, that, nine that, dash that, line? that the Philippines um, has to choose between China or United States or try to be neutral. I mean, there's a whole debate in your country about this, and it has this dispute with China about these islands. It has global implications. So I would like to hear your viewpoint on this? Well, it's, um, it is a very complex issue because it has a long history. And the history, the history of talking about its history itself mm -hmm. is complicated already. So how far back goes this history? Well, I think it goes as far as, as uh, let's say, um, the Opium War. Okay. But, um, because that's uh, one of the most humiliating events that happened in so Chinese So that's far history. more than 100 years ago. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And because of that opium war, the Chinese, you know, they learned from it. So they wanted to protect themselves yeah. from being defeated in that way again. And they were defeated in that way. Uh, they, they, they lost the war because mm -hmm. they had a poor navy. They had... Uh, very poor uh, coastal protection. Yeah. So because of that, you know, the, the, the Chinese wanted to make sure that this wouldn't happen anymore, mm -hmm. right? So they strengthened their navies. They would like to make sure that the enemies was as far as far away 
from their shores. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Chinese Nine Dash Line isn't actually a product of the Communist Party. But what is China. it? I mean, it's like when you look on the map, you have the South China Sea, yes. China in the north, Philippines to the east, Vietnam to the west, mm -hmm. Indonesia, Malaysia in the south, and then there's the Paracel Islands and the Spratlys, um, which technically belong to no one. Yes. But China just made nine dashes and said anything. It was actually 11. It, were, it was it, 11. <laughs> okay. So, so the, it, the nationalist government act was actually the one uh, who constructed this um, 11 dash. The, the Taiwan, dash line. The Taiwan government. Na, the now occupying um, Taiwan, right? Occupying. Yes. So now the one, the ruling the ruling okay. party uh, mm -hmm. of of Taiwan. So there it was actually the product of of um, the nationalist government. When um, the communists came into power, they were actually more um, flexible in their approach than the nationalists. That's why um, the non the Vietnam and China were able to negotiate. Mm -hmm. uh, bound, uh, one of the dashes yeah. that implicated uh, that uh, one of the dashes that was on the Gulf of Ton Tonkin. Tonkin. I'm sorry uh, if I don't pronounce it right. That's where the Vietnam War started huh? with the uh, fake accident, <laughs> the fake attack. Um, yeah. So so it, it so and then it 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 kind of evolved. You know the 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 significance of the nine dash line. Um, especially with the evolution in uh, the way we think about territory. Yeah, but that's the nine dash lines, uh, they are very close to the coast of these countries. And China says anything in the middle belongs to us. They're occupying the Spratlys, Paracel Islands. They, they're building uh, uh, runways, uh, military bases. Uh, and it's very close. It's much closer to the Philippines than to China. So. As a Filipino, I, I read Filipino papers, many say this is nonsense. It's, it, it doesn't belong to us, but certainly it doesn't belong to China. Mm -hmm. And we should have the fishing rights, but the Chinese, they're catching all the fish. So you're a Filipina and uh, uh, you're defending the Chinese position or not? Well, I'm not defending the Chinese position. I am defending... But that's what they say. Yeah, that's what they say because they don't understand what I'm saying. And because okay. anything, anything that is not, um, doesn't follow the... Um, hardline Filipino stance when it comes to uh, the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. um, these people um, take as pro-Chinese, but, yeah. but yes, my, exactly. my position is not pro-Chinese, but it's just simply a, based on a historical understanding of what happened in the South China Sea. The, mm -hmm. the South China Sea originally uh, didn't belong to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, there was freedom of navigation. Freedom, freedom of navigation was a norm in the pre-colonial South, uh, pre South China Sea mm -hmm. setup. Um, owning the sea was nonsense mm -hmm. to my ancestors. Right? It, it's, it's unheard of. Yeah. And because um, after colonization and after the European colonizers export, uh, um, uh, exported the, the idea of territory, especially of extending territory towards the sea, then these um, conflicts started to shape up. And as, as the concept of territory evolved, so was the conflict uh, in the South China Sea. Um, the first, the original countries that were actually in conflict in the South China Sea uh, were China and France. France was still oh. occupying Vietnam during that time. Yeah, and until 1956. Exactly. So mm -hmm. they were the first ones who tried to militarily occupy. Oh, um, wow. the I didn't know that. Yeah, the Spratlys. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, China said, uh, no, this is ours. Our fishermen have been going there for hundreds, uh, for, of, years. For, for hundreds of years, etc. Yeah. And then after that, uh, when the colonization happened, Vietnam inherited the French claim. Oh yeah, of course. But only, um, but it's not yet clear if France already. Um, how do how do you say this? Transferred the rights. Uh, whether they already gave up their claim at, uh, for the Spratlys, because the the South China Sea is it's it's such a huge area. Yeah, it's enormous. For the Paracel, the, the, they inherited yeah. the, the claim, the the French claim to the Paracels. Okay. But the the Spratlys, it's not yet clear whether the French already gave up their mm -hmm. claim. 
And after that, um, uh, in the 1950s, there, is, there was this Filipino navigator uh, by the name of Thomas Cloma. He went to the Spratleys, yeah. tried to claim it for himself. He wasn't aware that there, was a, there were already countries fighting over it. So he appropriated it privately. Oh. Privately. So yeah. the, the, the Philippines didn't, um, the, the Philippines didn't uh, stake a claim. Mm -hmm. they, everyone thought that Thomas Cloma was loony during that time. Mm -hmm. And then in the 1970s, it was the time that the Philippines first um, joined the territorial contest. It was during the time of Marcos. Yeah. But the thing about that was the original position of the Philippines when it entered the territorial disputes was um, the, the, the Spratleys uh, belong to no one, yeah. that it's a trust territory. Yeah. And Ferdinand Marcos actually based this on the, um, the San Francisco Treaty that ended the war in the Pacific. Okay. Well, if we go a bit further in time, President Aquino decided to put the case forward to the uh, International Court of Arbitration, if I'm correct. Yes. And uh, China lost, Philippines won. Yes. So it was a legal victory. By default. By default, because <laughs> China didn't show up. But it was, a, it was a very strange arbitration, because if you're going, if, if you, arbitration was supposed to be an agreement of two countries in conflict. Yeah. To have a third party decide their conflict. Yeah. There was no, uh, we call this... Um, the Chinese never showed up. So there was a no-show? They were, First, the, Chi the China didn't agree to bring the conflict into arbitration. Oh. And, of course, they will not show up because they didn't agree. <laughs> they didn't recognize the court. Is it a biased court or is it, I mean... I'm not going to say... I'm not going to say that it is a biased court. I, I have read the, the, the mm -hmm. decision yeah. and they have decided based on their reading of um, uh, UNCLOS, the, the law of the sea. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say that, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's just, um, you know, a matter of interpreting um, the yeah. law. But, but the problem there is the, the, ter the territorial disputes is uh, actually about who has sovereignty. And, mm -hmm. and this was explained to me by a maritime expert in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And he told me that, you know, there's no sense of talking about exclusive economic zone, sovereign rights, because these concepts spring from sovereignty. So mm -hmm. if you don't have sovereignty over these, what's the sense of, what's the sense of deciding who has sovereign rights? Mm -hmm. Because we must first decide who has sovereignty. And this is something that cannot be decided by the arbitration court. Well, one thing I understood, what surprised me very much, is that in the legal sense, the Spratly Islands are not islands. So that was a shocker. Uh, this was the greatest shocker. Yeah, it, it is correct. This was the greatest shocker in, uh, in the arbitration decision, which of course ruffled a lot of feathers, including the claimants, other claimants. For mm -hmm. example, the largest feature in the Spratly, um, Spratly group of, I, wouldn't say, I don't know if you can say it, islands, but let's just use that term. Spratly group of islands is Ituaba. And yeah. Ituaba is, current, is occupied by Taiwan because it was occupied by the nationalist yeah. um, government when it was still um, at the helm of China. So they're occupying the largest feature. So in all sense of the word, <laughs> Geographically speaking, it's a proper island. It's the largest um, feature there. But even that was declared to be not an island. And this is very interesting because if it's not an island, then it cannot generate... Um, why, it, is, why it's not an island? It is land that sticks out of the sea, surrounded by water. To, to me, it's an island. Uh, because it, the arbitration decision had a unique way of legally classifying what is an island. Oh. And, and their, their basis is because it cannot um, ha, uh, have, an econom it cannot have an economic life of its own. Oh, is that one of the conditions? Yes. It was made by the court or it already existed before that? Um, I, no, because this is a product. 
they, they interpreted a part in the law of the sea. But then, then it would mean that even if uh, Philippines wins the case, sort of, they still come out of a loser because there's no territory to claim. Yes. Um, uh, actually, yes, because there are certain features there in this. Because here's the thing. The, the, the huge part of the arbitral decision is determining the status of each feature. Mm -hmm. Right? Is this a low tide elevation? Is this a rock? Is this an island? Of course, there are no islands. Be um, because if it's not an, um, the thing about an island is if it is an island, then you can claim sovereignty over it. Yeah. It can have a territorial sea and it can have an exclusive economic zone. Yeah. Right? If it's not an island, but, and if it's just a rock, for example, it can only generate. Uh, a territorial sea, mm -hmm. right? And and if it's if it's a low tide elevation, then you cannot occupy it. It's not subject for um, territorial appropriation. And there are actually features the Philippines occupy occupy that are low tide elevations. And, and I was just like, okay, they they actually just sh uh, shot themselves at the foot. Yeah, so, because what did Philippines gain with this step going to the court of arbitration? Well. Well, it's a, a way to have some sort of uh, quote-unquote leverage against China. Well, that's that's what the government... A legal one? Or a... Well, that's what the government thinks, that it's a, mm -hmm. uh, especially the Aquino government, that it is leverage. But for me, it's not the leverage. And uh, uh, what about Duterte? Well, what is his approach? Duterte um, isn't that, is, isn't, a hard, isn't a hardliner when it comes to the South China Sea conflict. So he, mm -hmm. he actually saw um, that if the Philippines would continue its hardline stance, then it would lead to more trouble. So yeah, uh, yeah I, I read about it. He was afraid of a massacre if he would go to a war with China. Yes. And he doesn't want to be stuck in the middle between uh, China and the United States. Yes. Uh, I heard some, some of his comments like, we're not your little brown buddies and yeah. stuff like that. Um, so that brings me to the next subject, that's President Duterte. Um, here in the West, it's like a maniac, painted by the press as a maniac. In the night, he goes with his bazooka hunting uh, drug criminals. Uh, when he was a mayor, he killed a few people. He doesn't remember how many. So it's like a madman. Um, but you, as a blogger, you're, you're framed as a pro-Duterte blogger. So would be very interesting for me as an intellectual how you can defend uh, a person who seems to be unhinged. a dictator <laughs> and uh, unhinged. And uh, when I see on TV, you kill me or I kill you, it's like, oh, wow, it's, this is a president of a country. Looks like a rogue state. I know it's not true. but <laughs> Because you live in the Philippines. But I live in the Philippines. You live as a Filipina in the district. I live as a Dutch guy in the Philippines. But um, so this, this, somehow the picture we have in the West of Duterte is wrong. So now is your chance to give the correct picture. Well, I, I don't want to defend uh, President Duterte. Um, I think he doesn't need defending. He's the kind of person who doesn't really give a shit about what, <laughs> what other people think of him. That's why he, he, he's like that. Right. Um, it's, it has been an issue in his administration. Yeah. Um, he's, he's very poor PR. And when we raised this to, to them, they said that the president doesn't care. He doesn't even, he, he said <laughs> it to the United Nations, huh? I, 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 in the wrong grammar, he said, we don't give shit to them. I was yeah. talking about United Nations. Yeah, exactly. And, and Obama was a putanina. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I will not translate. You can imagine what it was. So uh, there, there is some vulgarity in this. Uh, Behavior. Yeah, but he has always been like that. Even even when he was a mayor, it was it was already his style. And I, I think um, in order for for people to because Duterte is an acquired deist, and <laughs> he's he's not the usual statesman who presents themselves well. So why you support him? Because I know that he could do the job of the president, and because of what he did in Davao City, and. What he did in, in Davao City was nothing short of spectacular. Davao City was once dubbed as uh, the Nicaragua of the Philippines um, mm -hmm. because it was a mess. It was very chaotic. 
Um, a lot of killings were there. There were um, there were terrorists all over the place. So, so he, he had all the killers killed, and then there was peace. No, he uh, actually it it it's, it didn't do that. What he did was he actually brokered some sort of mo um, modus vivendi with with, oh, really? with these different factions uh -huh. with with the new, new people's army with the the, the Muslim insurgents and etc. So he he actually. Um, he didn't only use sticks, he used carrots. So he's a mm -hmm. more complex person than, um, than his enemies would like to paint him to be. But, yeah. of, but of course, our enemies wouldn't, doesn't have any interest in portraying us as a complex person. But he, 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 he is a very good um, diplomat in a sense that he, he, he tried to, he's a very pragmatic leader. Yeah, so going back to uh, geopolitics, mm. um, his approach is totally different than from all the predecessing presidents. That Only with the he, previous president. But he wants to compromise with China, mm -hmm. and he's not choosing the... It's like a, a neutrality policy. Could you almost um, say that? The for, uh, neutral foreign policy. Because I would say, I think most of the Filipinos, they're more pro-US than pro-China or neutral. And even the military. So yeah, the military It's a very strong pro-American... Uh, very pro-US sense in the whole country. But this is nothing new. What, what uh, these call for a neutral Philippine foreign policy already started in the 1950s. Um, mm. um, it started with uh, the great Claro M. Recto. He was um, a senator and he tried to run for president and of course because he wanted a neutral foreign policy and this was yeah. during the Cold War. He didn't get and any chance. Philippines was just independent yeah, for a few years. And, yeah, and then... When was it, 1948, 47? Yeah. So he was a very vocal yeah. um, proponent of neutral foreign policy. He wanted um, the mutual defense treaty with the Philippines to be revoked because he believed that it would drag the nation into um, the war between great powers. So he, he wanted to, to forge that line as early as 1950s. So Duterte was not the first? No, but he was the first president. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't the first uh, politician who advocated for it, the, the great Clara M. Recto. But, and then after several years, Clara M. Recto died of a heart attack while in a speaking tour in Europe. Oh, <laughs> you, you think there's uh, more to it than just a heart attack? Well, based upon what I've read that, uh, you know, he, he might have been killed. Oh. So it's, but of course, we, we, we cannot confirm this, but the, mm -hmm. but because there were already rumors that, you know, the the powers that be <laughs> were after him. But it was, but it is, but it, but President Duterte is the first sitting president who actually wanted to have a neutral foreign policy. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say in, when you look at the historical perspective, we, uh, in the, we Dutch, and Indonesia, we have a colonial history yeah. together. So it's, you could compare it to the Philippines and the United States. Um, so the Netherlands is very sensitive to talk about Indonesia or to give them any advice or to get into their national local politics. But it's like the Americans, when you look at the embassy, it's a huge building. The, um, there's even on American uh, uh, warships, uh, there's Filipino staff. Yes. Um, it, it seems like Filipinos, they're very pro-American, so it must be very difficult for the Duterte to make a neutral uh, policy. Or is it wrong perception from my side? Uh, yes, the Philippines is, uh, a lot of Filipinos are very pro-U.S. Uh, and historically, um, the, the Chinese have a very, uh, Filipinos have a very bad um, reception of the Chinese, mm -hmm. even, even, even during the colonial periods. Yeah, I remember so why is it like this? I mean, your, your former colonizer is still very popular. Uh, can you explain this? Well, sort of. It, it's uh, well, he's uh, during the um, Spanish uh, Spanish time. You know, the, the, the Chinese has always always been perceived as people who take jobs from the Filipinos. Yeah. Right, because they have uh, cheap labor, even during the Spanish colonization. Oh. Uh, that's why it was easy for the Spaniards to convince the because Philippines. Because the Philippines was a colony from uh, Spain until 1898? Until 1898. Yeah. 
and then the Americans took over. Um, they, the Spanish, they got like two million dollars. I read somewhere. Twenty million dollars. Oh, Twenty million. Sorry, ten times more. But the Filipinos, they were never asked. So it was just like sold. Actually, um, the original agreement in the Washington Protocol was that the Spain would only give up certain ports. Okay. <laughs> And then when, the, Amer when um, the Treaty of Paris got negotiated, suddenly the diplomats wanted a lot. Okay. So they drew a line. Um, they, they, they drew a line over all these islands, including the Sultanate of Sulu, which was never yeah. actually colonized by That's Spain. That's the most southern part. Yes, yeah? which was actually not colonized by Spain. They just said, but okay, we, we want... Like to have that one too. We want everything... Um, they, because it was also the time that um, coordinates, um, you know, longitude and latitude started yeah. to become in vogue. But when the Spaniards colonized the Philippines, they don't know the they don't know the coordinates of, of, no, of what of they colonized. Not. They just know the locations. Yeah. So they don't have any idea that okay, this entire uh, Philippines is ours. They they, mm -hmm. they just know certain places. So but I was wondering, there were local people living there, so. Yeah, it's so not you go to the moon or to the <laughs> South Pole. And it's not like that. And the Philippines has no unity. So it was, it, it, there was no Philipp United Philippines. These are like independent communities. Okay. Yeah. Even before, uh, before the Spaniards came. And when the Spaniards came, they tried to forge a sense of community. But they never colonized all, all of the Philippines. They never colonized uh, the people in the mountains. They never, and, which is an independent uh, political community. They never colonized the Sultanate of Sulu. Um, so when the Americans um, negotiated the Treaty of Paris, so the, the, the Spanish negotiators were surprised, like, what are these coordinates? And people, you can actually read this because these are already available, <laughs> publicly yeah. available. And then, and then of course, you, um, the winners dictate the terms of, of these treaties. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Americans got what they wanted. Huh. Um, the Filipinos were not there. They were not Nobody allowed. Nobody asked to, them. Huh? They were not allowed to participate. Which I still find amazing. And, but in those days, it was very normal. Always in the Netherlands, you hear, well, then it was very normal. Um, but then let's, let's move. Uh, the United States, after the Second World War, became the dominating world power, mm. Pax Americana. Um, their official policy is they want to get rid of all colonization. It has to be modernized, the whole world. And so Self-determination. Self-determination. Yeah. Yes. So the Philippines got independent. Uh, the Americans, they put very big pressure on the Netherlands to give up Indonesia and yes. New Guinea. Yeah. Uh, that was very humiliating for the Dutch. Mm. Um, so then the Philippines became an independent country. And then... No, part of the Commonwealth. <laughs> part of the Commonwealth. <laughs> but, but the United States could dominate without officially the law in their hands, but still control yeah. big parts of the world. Um, but the Philippines, Filipinos, but I understand, they, they feel comfortable with this. The Indonesians don't, I mean, the Dutch, if they say we, we would still have influence, they, the Indonesians would laugh and say, go to hell. Well, because the Americans never left. They, they never really, they never really left. Um, the, the Philippines, they're, they're always there. I thought in 1991 yeah. the bases had to close down, the American bases, to, the because constitution was changed. Yeah. yeah, well, well, it's not because the constitution uh, changed, because the, the bases were not renewed. Yeah. Um, the, the rent of the bases uh, was just not renewed. And, and then when they left, um, <laughs> that's it. But they then, then afterwards they ne we negotiated a visiting forces agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, but, with but, them. but the United States is still very influential in the Philippines and Philippine politics. Yes, of course. <clears throat> it's it's very there. You, you will always see an influence of the United States in Philippine politics. Yeah, but this brings me to another subject: uh, freedom of the press. Mm. Um, in the Philippines, it's like, again, in the West, we get the picture that Duterte, he is a dictator, he controls all the media, he closes down ABS, CBS news. Um, there is this very brave young this Filipina woman, Maria Ressa, who has Rappler, and she's trying to fight for the freedom of the press, and uh, she's lauded by politicians here in the Netherlands. It's like she's a, like a dissident and very brave person. Um, but from other Filipinos here, it's like, Fifth column, fifth column, it's like she's trying to put American interest before Filipino interest. So how do you look at this? Well, 
I think um, people have this hypocritical, no, not hypocritical, but um, their idealistic view of the media. Um, the media always want to uh, portray themselves as speaking truth to power, but in reality, they are another power playing power politics. Mm -hmm. uh, they have their own power, they have their own interests, they have their own agenda that they would like to be protected. And in the Philippines, the media is actually owned by the country's elite. And mm -hmm. of course... It's not the only country where that's the case. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's not really about truth being sp uh, spoken to power, but a version, uh, um, truth according to how they perceive it that's aligned with interest, speaking to power, mm -hmm. right? So, and Rappler is just like that. It has its own interest. So what's the interest to... of Rappler then? Well, maybe the interest of its um, uh, funder, right? So who's the funder? It's Pierre Omidyar. So uh, when when uh, I, I know he's the found he was the founder of eBay and he yes. he injected money in the Intercept. So yes. but I think many of our viewers have no idea who is Pierre Omidyar. Well, he yeah he's the founder of eBay and he he kept funding. Why he put money in media? I, I don't really know, but but uh, as as they say that he you know he he wanted to portray himself as promoter of free media. Yeah, but then Glenn Greenwald just left The Intercept. Um, yes. Then they put money for uh, Maria Ressa with Rappler. Yeah. And it, it really penetrates the Philippine uh, landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really an influential um, blog, or what is it? Well, Rappler is an A online... news agency? <laughs> well, um, it... It portrays itself as a news agency, like media. Mm -hmm. um, but when um, the case against, uh, but but when you read the Security and Exchange Commission case against laughter, la laughter <laughs> against Rappler, yeah, they, one of the because in the Philippines, if you, the media must be one hundred percent Filipino owned, yeah, they don't want foreign ownership to avoid. They, uh, this external is, propaganda, this, uh, there's well, a this, reason for this. Yes, uh, this is actually mm -hmm. um, a product of um, the nationalist sentiments mm -hmm. in the Philippines because the Philippines was colonized for a long time. So but doesn't were, it make sense? I mean, you would like this law to be disbanded or you think there is some... Um, personally, if yeah. I want... Would you mind that, let's say, CNN opens up a shop in, uh, and it's a foreign-owned and they just broadcast around the whole country? What, what's wrong with that? Well, um, this is something that actually I haven't uh, um, thought about deeply. Okay. Or what, what's wrong about um, a foreigner owning um, media in the Philippines? But okay. when you what, but when you look at it in the context of um, Philippines gaining independence or or having or it it makes sense. The Philippines so because you could say let's say the the independence is fragile, so it has to be protected it must against be protected. enemy forces. So, okay. I think because the Philippines is a very young mm -hmm. country. Yeah. It has just been fully independent. Yeah. Fully well, independent. I'm just asking. I have no yeah. judgment about this at yeah. all. It's just yeah. uh, that's the issue that is... Uh, yeah, like for example, the, the Philippines is just a very... Uh, compared here in Europe, your freedom of the press is a long history. Mm -hmm. right? it, it, it is a freedom that it emerged... Um, from from the locals, yeah, right, like grassroots. From grassroots, right. If you study the history of Europe, right, the, the yeah. emergence of the freedom of the press, it's really a response against um, um, the monarchy, yeah. etc. Right? Yeah. But but in the Philippines, you know, the it's a very young republic. Mm -hmm. It only became fully independent after World War II. Yeah. Some some say that our independence started in 1898, but for me, it, it didn't start from 1898. It, it, it actually just formally started after World War II when, when the Americans already, like, left, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, not the left, but formally transferred, you know. Power or uh, yeah, the, the Philippines gained independence because it was given to the country. It's it not, was it given. Took it. 
Yeah. In the fight, no, it, it was given. It was given. <clears throat> so it was, it, it's very, it's a very young country. And if you're gonna compare it to a person's life, you know, the Philippines is just coming, I think it's, it's just coming of age uh, right uh, now. And I think, sense. yeah, I think, I think, I think the Duterte administration is the coming of age of Philippine politics because, you know, his assertion that the Philippines must be independent mm -hmm. and is, you know. Yeah, that, I, that, 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 that statement, we are not your little brown bodies, that, that kind of struck me because it, it, it's like almost there is an inferiority complex. Uh, and do I touch a sensitive point for the nation or is this nonsense or? Well, for Duterte it is, because, um, especially with his um, background as someone from Mindanao. You know, Mindanao, yeah. the, uh, the southern Philippines, yeah. always had a very problematic relationship with the United States. Right. Because it also it's part because it's Muslim territory. Muslim territory and the 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 massacres that yep. happened in Mindanao. Right. One of the pivotal moment in Duterte's political career was when he was mayor of the of Davao, yeah. and and um, the Americans wanted to establish a drone center in Mindanao. And when was that? This was during um, Iraq War, so 2004, oh. sometimes, sometimes, okay. when, when, when Bush was still um, yeah. the, the president. And the only stable city in, in Mindanao was his city. Yeah. And Duterte said no. No. So he said no. And, and he got a powerful enemy. Of course, right? And mm -hmm. you know Mindanao is like one of the uh, one one of the strategic areas for the United yeah, States to course. launch its war um, against Al Qaeda, etc. Yeah. Right. And Duterte said no because it would um, you know the, the, the Muslim population wouldn't wouldn't want it. Mm -hmm. Right. And and because of that, uh, there was an incident that happened. I don't know if this happened before that or after um, that. There was this guy who was occupying a hotel in Davao City. He, he was like staying in a hotel in Davao City yes. and then his room exploded. Just like that? Just like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, the bomb that he was making was accidentally exploded. Mm -hmm. So the guy was hospitalized and then, you know, of course, Duterte wanted the guy investigated. Mm -hmm. and suddenly, FBI agents went to Davao, frisked him away. Wow, that's why it's it's that's why when you ask the thirty, it's one of the things that he would tell you. Like, mm -hmm. it, it 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 he felt insulted. Yeah, because of that. Can imagine. Yeah, because this is this is this is like, I'm the mayor. Why, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. right? So so the guy faced away, and we never heard anything from the guy. Talking about powerful forces, <laughs> yes. I like to bring up another issue. <laughs> um, is also of my personal interest. You have been framed as a Russian spy. <laughs> uh, I fell from my chair because same happened to me. Uh, since two weeks, I am a Dutch guy who is uh, directed by the Russian military intelligence agency GRU. Yeah. So there's some chip in my brain and they can just remote control me. Some, And then all the Dutch media took it over. Mm. So. Uh, what happened to you? Because it happened to you. <laughs> Similar thing happened to you. <laughs> you. You think it's funny, yeah? <laughs> no, because it was a joke that readers of my blog created that I'm a Russian spy. What happened was <laughs> Rappler, Rappler again, um, wrote this story. I think this was two years ago. They wrote a story about how Russia is infiltrating social media yeah. of the it's Philippines. Almighty Putin. Yeah, exactly. And you know, yeah. it was a very it's 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 the wet dreams of conspiracy theories, the way the way that they link things together. <laughs> so they said that yeah. um, Russia is infiltrating um, Philippine um, politics through um, social media influencers, and it included me. So their their evidence. Well, technically, was, it would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would make sense, but it. <laughs> But their reasoning is like very idiotic. They said that because I, um, 
I, because I posted an interview of Adam Gary. He's like a geopolitical writer. Yeah. And Adam Gary just so happens to be too pro-Western. But he's not a Russian. But he's not Russian, right? No. What, what, who, Adam Gary, I, I think, don't know. I think he's British. He doesn't or, sound Russian. No, I think he's British. Mm -hmm. But but he's part of, but he is always being invited by Russia today. So yeah, the Russian, ah, okay. the Russian <clears throat> connection. And... But I posted his interview because one of Filipino, one of my Filipino readers based in Australia interviewed him. And then that Filipino asked me if I could post the interview. Yeah. So I did that. And you did that. Yeah. And suddenly I was like, you know, the Philippines is being infiltrated by Russia through social media influencers. And then one, one media officer of one, one media officer working for a congressman. For, for the ultra left in, in Congress, suddenly said that I am a Russian puppet. <laughs> and yeah. so my, my readers just said, oh, let's just, you know, take it a little bit further. That's like, us. Let's it's, take it as a badge of honor. Yeah. And like, exploit it. Yeah, maybe like just like, take this story a bit further. You are yeah. a Russian spy. <laughs> and yeah. I was just like, okay. I'm considering similar uh, Approach. propaganda so, efforts. Yeah, and... Yeah. and, and it, well, on the other hand, it's very intimidating when uh, they pick on you. Yeah, it is very intimidating. Because, because you were compared to Joseph Goebbels. Uh, you're working for the Russians. I mean, I think if, every... you, if you read your blog, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> but, but you have to deal with it. It's not nice. When your mom calls, she says, what did you do? Oh, my God. It's, uh, I, I had been through a lot of outrageous uh, stuff in my yeah. four years of political blogging in the Philippines. You develop and elephant skin or it still hurts? I think, well, um, I think it still, it, it, it still bothers me. Yeah. Because uh, in some sense that I'm not used, I, I, I'm still not comfortable with having this kind of fame or notoriety, however you put it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I, I have lost some friends, and yeah. I have people who wanted to become my friends, but you know yeah. why they want to do. So it 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 become you know fame has that quality that really nags, you know that that chips away your ability to to trust. Mm -hmm. people or form yeah. meaningful connection. I recognize that. Because, the, you know, at the back of their head, you know, still, oh my I, God, I am... I'm at the beginning of this process, but you went through all already. Yeah, so they were like, you know, at the back of their head, oh my God, I'm... Yeah. And even even some of my friends already, you know, trying, you know, just turn into either my enemies because they we don't agree, because our political uh, uh, views don't align or... Some some of them, um, some some of them just just you know treat me as if I'm no longer their friend. Like I'm yeah. already this political blogger, mm -hmm. and then they they are friend with this blogger with over seven hundred thousand followers. Like you were ex you were exposed, like a Kremlin agent, and uh, <coughs> nobody can trust you again. Oh, well, <laughs> no, I, I'm happy you so, you think it's funny. But but in a good way, I have you know I have. Uh, this made me realize who are my tr true friends are. That's true. And and yeah, and I just you know. Yeah, knowing who your true friends are is very important. Exactly. So and and it this this actually helped me sift through uh, fake people. <laughs> I think we got a in this interview we got a very good picture of you. And uh, <laughs> is there anything I should have asked which I didn't? Um. I'm not really sure. What 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 do you think? Uh, well, I, I think it was a very useful discussion we had and uh, very enlightening. Yeah. And maybe we should make a part two. I don't know, but for, <laughs> I think for today it's good enough. Yeah, I, maybe. <laughs> maybe we don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. Thank you very much for being here, Sas. Yes. And, uh, thank you so our much. Our viewers, thank you very much for watching. Cafe yeah. Welchmats. Bye bye. Thank you. Wat als deze video wordt verwijderd?
Wat als dit kanaal niet meer bestaat? KV Weltsmerts heeft een plan. Ga naar onze site en registreer jezelf. En word onderdeel van de oplossing.